So yeah, I don't often hear people argue at one another about the weather or use it as a way to declare a certain status over another person. Even though we all seem to seek something deeper, the weather has become a token for neutral, easy, and accessible topics to discuss with just about anyone, especially if you live in Halifax. <laughs> so, lately I've been asking myself, why do we all talk about the weather so much? I came to the conclusion that we talk about the weather because within our human experience, despite our cultural and economic differences, it's an inconvenience or pleasure that we all share. The weather is a safe topic in a world where nothing really feels safe anymore. Everything is about public image. We are in a society that is so afraid and hung up on differences, people are spending fortunes of time and money just to fit in. Fit into social groups, schools, political parties, job titles, relationships, typically at the expense of who they truly are and the values they hold deeply. It's that where do I fit feeling that had me stuck falling into a deep depression and a pit of self-doubt until about a year and a half ago when I met a community of people that would change my life and spur me into taking one of the biggest risks I didn't know I was taking. Today, I'm going to share with you some of the lessons I have learned climbing out of that pit of self-doubt and how the public housing community I have been working with for almost two years has completely changed my life and allowed me to embark on ideas about how we can move from a self-interest society to a society that learns, innovates, and leads together. Over a year and a half ago, I started the community development initiative called Progress in the Park. Start... Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Starting it and... Well, several months after starting it and building a small team of students who helped me with the initial startup stages and numerous fundraisers, I had five major projects and programs under Progress in the Park, and I was submitting papers to incorporate a new nonprofit, SIPA, Communities and Progress Association. Both organizations are very much in their, in their infancy and run 100% on volunteers I am deeply grateful for. Though I am proud of my development work, I want to share with you my story of how Mulgrave Park and the rest of my community built me into a leader. Because that's how I learned that individuals don't build communities alone. Communities build leaders. For the better part of my developmental years, I grew up fairly poor to a single mom. A few years later that, after that, my stepdad made us a family of three. Handsome, I know, right? <laughs> Despite the realities of treading on and off the poverty line, transportation barriers, addictions, drinking, gambling, mental illness, constant moving from place to place, my mom made sure of four essential things. I had a roof over my head. I was aware of current affairs and societal issues. I could do at least one thing that I loved. At that time, that was hockey. And she, knew, she made sure I knew that I was loved and supported for who I was. Growing up the way that I did in the north end of Halifax didn't always sit right with some of the families I played hockey with. My family didn't look like theirs. I started working at 12 to help pay the bills, and I had that from the wrong side of the track attitude, apparently. But there are only so many times you can overhear parents expressing their concern about you hanging out with their children and feeling like you aren't equal until you become very pissed off. When I finished grade 8 in junior high, I knew I wanted something more. I was watching the news one evening when I saw a clip of a story about Newbridge Academy, a new school in Sackville for hockey players and those seeking new learning opportunities. Perfect, I said to myself. I hopped on the computer, went to their website, and made a list of all the benefits of going to the school, which I then took to my mom immediately. She listened to me riddle off my list, and without uttering anything else, she asked the magic question. How much will it cost? $7,000. <laughs> Her and my stepdad both laughed and said, yeah, right. At this point, most obedient children would probably accept the disappointment or argue some more. I didn't do either. A week later, I called the headmaster of Newbridge Academy, Cliff Johnston. I told him that I'd like to have a meeting with him and learn more about his school. Being 13 or 14 at the time, he probably expected me to show up with my parents, but mine had no idea what I was about to do. In my determination, I found the confidence to bus 40 minutes out of the city to Sackville, to Newbridge Academy, where I sat with Cliff and I told him my story, my interest, my goaltending profile, and why I thought I would be a valuable addition to his school. So then I topped it off with a catch. I want to come here, but I can't give you any of the tuition. $7,000? None. Not giving it to you. And he said, okay, let's talk about how we can make that work. 
And we did, and he waved it all for me and let me into the school. Next thing I knew, I was at Newbridge Academy. Cliff Johnson took a chance on me as one of, and was one of the first people to support my ambition and teach me an extremely valuable lesson about access to information. He explained to me that education wasn't about being able to memorize facts, ace tests, or hone academic achievements. Education was learning about how to escape the textbooks in the classroom and make the world your classroom. At Newbridge, I learned not what knowledge there was in the world, but what tools I had available to me to discover the world. Cliff encouraged me to be critical, ask questions, and research efficiently and effectively, and to not be afraid to ask people to mentor me. Newbridge was one of the, was the big, first big step in learning how to think independently and create opportunities for myself. But I wouldn't have been able to do it without Cliff believing in me and making me a part of the Newbridge Academy community. For the years to come, this newfound philosophy on education would make me a horrible student in the, in the traditional sense. I had no patience for the classroom setting or reading textbooks. I was critical of everything and was terrified of what was happening in the world around me. During high school, I had my hockey career ended by a few concussions, which now I'm extremely grateful for. But it meant that I had to start rethinking my future and find new passions and create new opportunities for myself once again. I looked around and I said, okay, political science. On a whim, I decided to apply to St. Mary's University. I'm barely going to school now, but it was fun at the time. <laughs> Fast forward to the summer of 2013. I have a year of university under my belt, my own downtown apartment, a budding interest for the arts, I've acted in a few plays, acquired a taste for bitter coffee and good red wine, a near vegan diet, and a need for intellectually stimulating conversation. I was, I was pretentious as hell, I was, every I was everything I grew up making fun of. In the middle of September that year, I was canvassing with a friend of mine in Mulgrave Park a public housing neighborhood in the north end of Halifax I grew up around and I went to school with many of the families from there. Now as an adult talking to residents in the community, I had realized two things. One, how stuck up and snobby I'd become. And two, that I had turned my back on my own roots and become completely ignorant to the challenges and obstacles those coming from the bottom had to face. Constantly not feeling good enough, surviving your life instead of living it, always putting your loved ones first with whatever means you have left to give, and constantly doing rotating trade-offs with the necessities of a happy and healthy home. But while I was in Mulgrave Park, I was also struck with many other liberating realizations. I wasn't getting in my new life, where I felt that I had joined a class of people who were blindly obsessed with their own privilege. I saw that those around me who were trying to help were almost too proud to be helping someone that, though maybe subconsciously, they saw as less than them. The sense of pride, resilience, and realness I was seeing in Mulgrave Park was unbelievable. The sense of community people have despite having the odds against them and often being discriminated against or isolated was unmatched by any other group of people I had ever met. Later that day, after talking to residents from almost every one of the 318 units, I met someone that would really pull all the pieces of my revelation together for me. Elaine, president and one of the founders of the Mulgrave Park Tenants Association operating a food bank, a family resource center, and much more. This woman was moving mountains to provide opportunities and security for people in her community. And she did it all without looking for the spotlight or turning her back on her roots. I was in awe of by how much Elaine could carry on her shoulders. And though she wasn't alone in these efforts, her spirit had me completely captivated. And right away, I knew I wanted to work with her. When I started Progress in the Park, the idea was simple. It was a project that would focus on developing infrastructure to improve accessibility to different opportunities for residents in Mulgrave Park. But a month into building a small team of student volunteers to help me in my mission, I realized there was much more to it. I racked my brain trying to understand how I never heard of all the positive work being done in the community or the leaders who were stepping up to provide opportunities for their neighbors. All the language around discussing residents of public housing or recipients of social assistance was negative, presumptuous, and patronizing. I was still excited about the garden and the playground, but then I started to envision progress in the park becoming much more than an infrastructure project. I began to see it as a way to challenge negative perceptions of Mulgrave Park and the people that live there. To do that, I realized we'd have to bridge a gap between communities of people who saw themselves different and thus separate. I wanted to bring a new focus to the strengths and positive aspects in Mulgrave Park so that it could inspire other communities to come together and build one another up. 
And these are all some of the headlines uh, since starting Progress in the Park that I think are um, an example of that. I truly believe that the reason Elaine was successful in her ventures to build new services for her community was because she listened to residents and understood why she wanted to do something. Once leaders understand why they want to do something and they believe it, their vision will become infectious. People will join them and the rest of the what, where, how will come together because people work so much harder when they believe in why they are doing something and have the freedom to be themselves. One of the many other things I love about working in the park is that you have to earn people's trust. People from the park are real and they expect you to be too. If you're not open or genuine, they will see right through that. They tell you exactly what they are thinking and there's no pressure to be someone you're not. That was a refreshing contrast to what I was seeing in the university business community, a seemingly exclusive club for those coming from the top who spoke in constant, well-crafted pitches and were caught in a spiral of concern for how they dressed, how much money they could make, how many competitions they could win, and how they could market themselves as leaders and visionaries above all else. Not only was it easier to be the version of myself that felt most authentic and didn't require basing myself worth in the opinion of other people or my status in these institutions. But when I put these two versions side by side and acted in a way that I was living out my values that I was raised on that mirrored those in Mulgrave Park, I actually had more success fitting in and though it wasn't my intention, I started winning competitions and growing my network exponentially. I saw then the power of direct accessible and real language in order to connect people on a more human level. When I stopped speaking like I was reading out of a textbook or defending a thesis, more people listened. I was speaking in clear and relatable terms so that people could understand what I was saying and then support me with more confidence. Not being so caught up in my appearance or ensuring that I could outsmart the people around me, I was able to become way more observant of societal trends and teach myself that things that applied to the present reality I was living in. Suddenly, my thoughts and opinions started to be sought out and people trusted me. Just like I did with Cliff at Newbridge, when I started Progress in the Park, I was spending copious amounts of time sending emails and making phone calls asking people to have meetings with me. The learning curve I was on through this work surpassed any kind of knowledge I could have gained in the classroom at the time. I didn't have previous interests of all the topics that I was learning about, but I knew that I had to take the time to understand them because they were a part of a puzzle that I believed in putting together. I was learning more about politics from studying the policies I had to work around than I was in the, in the classroom. I was learning all core business principles from marketing to finance. I was learning psychology, what, graphic and web design, gardening, networking, how to allocate resources on a budget, how to read and write legal documents, how to manage a growing team. But most importantly, I was learning how to be a leader whose goal was to share what I knew and make people comfortable sharing with me. Sometimes when I try to explain my learning style, I ask the question, if you're trying to learn something new, would you rather be in a room full of learners, or sorry, students, and, or a room full of teachers? I feel like in so many, of our, so many scenarios of our lives, we put people in boxes of those who have knowledge and skills and those who don't. We see those as scholars or professionals, and then we see the other group as people expected to work low-wage labor jobs. Thus, we create a hierarchy where we value some people more than others. I don't want to be in a room full of teachers who are only there to talk at me. And I don't want to be in a room full of people who feel like they have nothing to offer because society has told them time and time and again that they are less than, that they don't have something to share with me. I want to be in a world where people are as comfortable sharing what they know from their own unique human experience as they are talking about the weather to strangers. I don't want to meet resume versions of people. I want to meet people who share their stories and know why they are doing what they do. When you look close enough and open your eyes, valuable wisdom can come in some of the most unexpected forms because you don't have to be perfect to make progress. I see everyone I have ever interacted with in my lifetime as educators, including these little goofball friends of mine, because they have chosen to share part of their experience and how they perceive the world with me. Their ideas and influence is what makes me work the way that I do. We will. As a community, we will build leaders 
by giving one another the confidence to think independently and challenge the status quo, by taking the time to listen to one another's stories and ideas, and understanding our why, the meaning and cause behind our actions. We have to find the strength within our differences and be ready to teach just as much as we are ready to learn. We cannot abandon people as soon as they take a leap away from safety. We have to assure others within our community of our faith and trust in them to pursue their dreams. This is why with SIPA, I want to move forward by connecting communities of people through their differences to make positive change and inspire new leaders that will benef benefit us all collectively and not just as individuals. If it wasn't for the incredible people I met who took a chance on me, who shared their experience with me and supported me even through the dark times, I would have been one of the many people written off. But instead, I am here with the opportunity to have talked to you all today. And so thank you. And thank you, TEDx Dalhousie.